My name is Dr. Harrison and I'm the principal here at Legacy Magnet Academy. Regardless of what industry you choose to go to, whatever job you may choose in the future, it really doesn't matter. What's most important is do you have the soft skills to be able to be successful in whatever career you choose, whether that's a doctor, a business person, it kind of doesn't matter. There's a set of soft skills that are applicable to any profession you might choose. Um, and those consist of being a strong leader, being able to collaborate well with others, being able to think critically and be able to discern between different ideas and, and determine which one might be the best course of action and be able to move forward with that. Looking at the world around you and, and looking for problems that you might come up with solutions to. All of these are skills that I feel like no matter what you do, they're going to prepare you well for your, your career and your future. And they just so happen to also be the soft skills that are really important in the business world. And I feel that tied through technology, innovation, design, entrepreneurship, we're able to really focus in on those soft skills. And so while our focus may be on entrepreneurship, we're really preparing students for any career they might choose. So when we first started to conceive of Legacy and figure out what our, our program was going to look like, we had a lot of conversation around whether we would use AP curriculum, advanced placement curriculum, whether we would, you know, was it worth considering IB? Was it worth looking at college courses? Like what was the right um, path for us to take? And there's pros and cons to everything. But one of the things that we, we learned in our research and in talking with schools that were offering, you know, a variety of advancement options is that oftentimes with AP classes, more and more often, universities are starting to move away from accepting those units. And, and that was really disappointing to me to think that a student might work really hard through high school, take these advanced classes to pay and take these tests and pass and then not be able to take those units with them on, on the next end. The other piece of it that concerned me personally was my own personal experience as a student in taking advanced placement classes and having teachers in my family, some of whom teach advanced placement classes, that oftentimes you can lose sight in an advanced placement class of the curriculum and of the content and focus focus a bit more on the test itself um, because you feel so compelled to make sure that you help those students pass so that they do get those credits that sometimes it can head towards more of a test prep class than it can at truly delving into content and delving into the learning. And so that was something I wanted to avoid. Now, we still could have gone with advanced placement and just made sure that we stayed focused on the content, but it was something I was mindful of. And then as I met with IVC, Irvine Valley College, um, who is kind of our district's local partner, and talked with them more about what the options might be through IVC, it just felt like we could select classes that we knew would be transferable pretty much regardless of what college you might choose. Um, the exception might be a few selective private schools, but for the most part, we could choose classes that we knew would be transferable that also aligned really closely with our core values here at Legacy and within our magnet theme of Tide. So choosing communications and knowing that if a student is going to be successful in the business world, they're going to be able to pitch an idea and get someone to buy into what they're trying to sell them, that they need to be strong communicators. The fact that we could bring in college courses that would give them that piece, that would really build that solid foundation as freshmen, and then also knowing that COM 1 and COM 3 are the high, most highly transferable and highly desirable courses that you could take with you to um, a bachelor's degree at pretty much any university, it, it just felt like the right choice for students. Currently, I now have six CT pathways. Here. So we have one in marketing, one in media arts design, one in uh, manufacturing product development, one in information commute, computer technology pathway, and then the one we just most recently added this year is one in um, dramatic production. What's great about CTE Pathways, so there's a couple pieces about CTE Pathways I think that are really important for students and for the school itself. So one of the factors that under the current state system, when we're judged as a school and compared to other school sites, compared to other districts, we have what's called a dashboard. And that's where all of the information lives in terms of how our students are performing, how we're performing as a school, and kind of our score or, or how we're judged is based on that dashboard. And one of the major components on the dashboard that gives you kind of the largest boost in how you're um, ranked is college and career readiness. And so there's several factors that can play into college and career readiness. Dual enrollment is a big factor in college and career readiness. So like obviously we have a big sector of that. CTE pathway completion is also considered a major college and career readiness indicator. So having CTE pathways on our campus really helps us on our dashboard. So that's for us. For the students, 
College and career readiness indicators are also a big component now of college acceptance. It's one of the factors that colleges are looking for. So by offering our CTE pathways, we're giving students access to that strong college and career readiness indicator that they can take with them on their applications. The other piece of that is we've done pretty extensive research, especially when we opened the school, as to what other school districts were doing with regards to CTE pathways. We weren't able to find anywhere else where a student could get more than Typically one, um, in rare occasions, we found schools where students were able to obtain two CT pathways through the course of their high school career if they were very focused on getting those two pathways and it kind of limited the other classes they could take. Because of the design of our school, our students, in certain circumstances, the exception would be like our athletes, they're, they're a little more limited on what they can take. Um, but most of our students are actually able to earn up to five CTE pathways. And now with our six, they really could actually earn all six by the time they graduate. There's no other school in the state of California where that's possible. So that's something that when our our students apply to college, it's going to really have them stand out from the rest of the students across the state and across the country because they're going to have this readiness indicator that others just can't possibly have. And then in terms of what obtaining a CTE provides for you, kind of the, the intrinsic piece that it provides for you, the whole point of CTE and why it was brought into our state and brought into our schools is to expose students to future career options. I mean, that's really what it's all about, which is what legacy is all about. So it just made complete sense for us to focus on CTE pathways um, in terms of exposing our students to the multiple careers that are out there for them with the skill set that we're teaching them through time. Any CTE pathway is um, a minimum of a two-class path. You have to have what's called a concentrator, which is the first class, and then a capstone, which is the, the completer class. So there was a whole year where I was identified as principal, but Legacy hadn't opened yet, and I was given a year to work with a team of folks down at the district office to really plan for our curriculum. And so we did a lot of research that year. We went and visited a lot of different schools that had similar setups to ours in terms of smaller school size, some of them 6'12", some of them just 9'12", but really looking at kind of that smaller size, magnet focus, you know, all of the students focused in kind of one on one central idea. And one of the themes we kept seeing coming up over and over again as we visited these different schools that were very unique but also very similar to what we were trying to create was that most of them were project-based learning schools. So we felt like that was something worth exploring for us. We signed up for some trainings um, to go learn more about it. I went up and visited a school up in Napa, California. That's kind of one of the premier project-based learning schools in the nation. It's, it's the school that everyone goes to visit if they're looking at doing project-based learning. So we went and spent a couple days there talking with our students, talking with our teachers, and talking with their kind of training team. And we ended up partnering with them for the training that we did here. And so what project-based learning is, is it's really, you know, you think back to like when I was a student, school was you went to class, your teacher did usually some kind of lecture, you, you received the information, you took notes on it, you maybe went home and did some homework on it, read, read a chapter in your textbook, answered some questions, and then you took a test. Like that, that's what learning was when I was a student. There wasn't a lot of hands-on opportunity. There wasn't a lot of projects per se. Projects more often were just research. Like you would research a topic and then you would present your teacher with several pages about that topic. That was that was a project. Project-based learning is taking the emphasis off the teacher and putting the emphasis more on the students. So the teacher may present the students with some topics or with some pieces of their curriculum or pieces of knowledge that they wanna share with them, but then leave it a little more open-ended for students to select within that um, what they want to research, what they want to study, what problem they want to try to solve. And then they're able to take that piece and really spend a considerable amount of time researching, experimenting, um, trying to come up with a solution, testing out that solution, going back and reiterating and trying again. So project-based learning is meant to be much more hands-on. It's meant to be much more long-term. So any project students are working on, it's meant to be done over the course of several weeks rather than maybe you know one class period or a couple days. It's meant to be done in groups. So most of project-based learning is meant to be collaborative, which fit really nicely in with what we knew we wanted to do here in terms of building that kind of collaboration skill for students. And then the bigger piece of it that also really fit nicely in with our magnet focus of Tide and where we wanted to go was that project-based learning is about creating a mindset within your students and, and within adults as well. Um, I think even the teachers and myself, all of us on staff have kind of shifted in our thinking and our mindset working with project-based learning. It's about looking at the world around you, your community, whatever your lens might be, and looking for what, what are the holes, what are the problems, what are the things that could be improved upon, and really having almost that be your mindset at all times. Like, how, what can I personally do to make this a better place? And so looking for those problems, trying to problem solve through solution, you know, potential solutions, and then really spending time around actually taking that idea 
like to the community, to an authentic audience. It's some of it's theoretical, but some of it we really do want our students to actually put into practice. So a great example is our 11th graders right now are doing a civic action project. They're coming up with, you know, with an idea of how they can improve their communities, um, whether that's school-based, whether that's community-based. And many of them are taking it directly out to the community and putting it into practice. So one group was working on how do we improve driving safety? And so they created a poster with, you know, driving safety tips that they've got out now to the local high schools to try to target some of our younger drivers. And so so each group has found a way that they can connect their idea for solving a problem in their community to actually taking it out to the community and solving it. So that was something I found out when I was first hired on was that we would not be offering athletics. And so the rationale behind it is the way CIF works. So CIF is the governing board that oversees all sports in the state of California. The way CIF works is once you are once you offer one CIF sanctioned sport, so even if we were to offer just one here, like let's say we were to offer tennis, right? Because that's that could be an individual sport. We don't need that many kiddos to be able to do it. Tennis would be like feasible to offer here at Legacy. Once we offered one CIF sanctioned sport, we would now be what's called a CIF sanctioned site. And once you're a CIF sanctioned site, your students are only able to access sports at your site. So the second we offer one sport, we would lose access to any other sports anywhere else. What the downside of that is, is because we're such a tiny school, we're only ever going to have at the very most 480 students in our high school and likely it'll always be a little bit smaller than that. So very tiny. We would likely never have enough students to have an entire football team. That's unlikely because there's quite a few students to run a football team, right? Certainly, like, we probably wouldn't have the talent to have a successful football team if we were able to scrounge enough kiddos together to play. The same would be said for most competitive team sports. We probably wouldn't have enough students interested in that sport with, with enough skill set to actually be able to be competitive. So we would be hurting our students in terms of that piece. By not offering any sports on our campus, what it then allows is for our students to have the ability to play CIF sanctioned sports at their home high school and having access to the wide array of sports that their home high school has to offer. So it, it's almost like by limiting our options here to nothing, we open their options by giving them access to their home high school. Obviously, the downside of that is there's the travel between the two schools, which can be difficult, especially before the students are driving, you know, so it puts the burden on their parents. The downside is in junior and senior year, if if you're an athlete here at LMA, you're giving up an elective to be able to go play that sport. Now, that would be the case at a traditional high school as well. I mean, after sophomore year, when the PE requirements are, are satisfied, your sport now does become an elective. I mean, so th that's the case anywhere, but because the way our pathway is set up, nobody wants to give up any of our <laughs> any of our electives. So by being an athlete, like you are going to have to make choices and lose out on something, which is unfortunate. So all that being said, so our students do have access to all the sports at their home high schools. And we fortunately actually... We're able to get the district to approve this year for the current school year and then also moving forward to add into that mix. Um, also cheer, dance, color guard, um, all of those pieces, which in the past, our first two years that we were open, we weren't allowed, students weren't allowed to try out for those because they weren't considered CIF sports. But we were able to make the case at the end of last school year to, to get those added in. So the new criteria now that they look at is it doesn't have to be a CIF sanctioned sport, but what it has to be is a class that's offered at the, at the home high school that's offered six period as an athletics class. So it has to count. Um, if a student were to take that as a freshman or sophomore, it would count for their PE credit. So it counts as athletics. And it has to be a class that's, that they only need the one class to get the credit. So the reason for that is if you wanted to be in marching band, marching band is offered six period. It is, um, it will count for PE credits. Like it does count as athletics. However, to be in marching band, you actually have to take marching band and orchestra or marching band and jazz band. Like you have to take a two class pack. So our students can't do that. So marching band is kind of the one that's excluded, but all of the other pieces our students now have access to, which is really exciting because it's, it's more options. Here on campus, we certainly don't have obviously the sports what we do have are a couple things. So for our middle school, we do participate in the district-wide, the TPSF sports that all of the middle schools participate in. So it's volleyball, basketball, and cross country. Um, so we do those throughout the year with our middle school students. We also have some sport clubs. They tend to vary from year to year. Like nothing seems to really have stuck from year to year. It seems to be whatever the students are interested in, but we've had a pickleball club, a golf club, archery, ping pong. I think the, the question about being established with colleges, that that's a really tricky one. Like I would say all of our students that are here right now, especially our juniors currently, 
are taking a major leap of faith, right? Because we can't promise you anything. What we can say is that part of that research we did that year that we were offsite, we visited multiple schools that were in similar situations to us that, you know, when they first started, they started with freshmen, those freshmen matriculated up, they had their first graduating classes, very tiny school, like met all the profile markers that we need in terms of small class size, unique classes, the dual enrollment piece, like all the pieces we have. And so we were able to talk with them about what did that look like for your first few graduating class. So we were able to get what we feel like is decent predictive data on what it will potentially look like for our first graduating class. We also met with multiple college admissions folks, counselors, college admissions um, representatives from Cal States, from UCs, and from um, a couple different selective private schools to have them look at our model and kind of weigh in on, like, is there anything we're missing? Is there anything we're doing that would disadvantage our students, you know, on the back end when they go to apply for college? What do you think our students, you know, chances are of getting in? And like, how, how does a profile like our school look for you as the admissions counselor, like receiving a student from our school? How do you look at what our students would have to offer? And all of the feedback we got from all three of those levels of institutions was that the students from Legacy with, with the CTE pathways, with the level of dual enrollment that they're gonna have in place, with the uniqueness of our program and their ability to what, what we believe, and again, this is we're, we're predicting, but what we believe is gonna be to sell themselves through their college essays and through their applications. Our students are building such a skill set of branding themselves and being able to sell who they are and what they stand for in a way that most high school students cannot. What we heard from all of the colleges is the legacy student is going to stand out. Like they are going to be a top candidate because they're going to possess something that others just do not have. The other piece that they shared that I feel like we've said to parents over and over and over again, and it's hard for parents to believe, is they really are not compared to the other schools in the, in the way that we think they're compared to other schools. So for example, um, it's not possible at Legacy to get a 5.0. The way our classes are structured, you just can't get one. It's, it's not within what you can get. And parents worry that their kids from here with their 4.6 are going to be compared against a Beckman 5.0. The reality of it is that's not how it works. The colleges will only compare you with regards to your grade point average against what's offered at your school site. So you're only compared to what is the most rigorous set of courses offered at your site and how did you, did you take the most rigorous set of courses and then how did you perform in that most rigorous set of courses compared to other students on your site. So that kind of removes that element from it. That's not how it will be considered. The other piece that colleges told us as well as the other uh, high schools we spoke to with similar kind of setup stars, there's a huge benefit actually to being at a tiny school um, because the likelihood of 50 kids all going for the same college is pretty small. Whereas if you look at like a Beckman where you're graduating six, 700 kiddos, they're all AP honors, like top kiddos. A lot of them are going for the same school. And so you've got 50 or 60 kids being compared against each other going for the same school. And so the reality of it is only a couple of them are going to get in. Whereas at Legacy, with only 78 graduating seniors next year, the chances of them all comp competing for the same schools is going to be very low. Chances are much more of them are going to get into their top like one or two choices than you would at a school where you have a much higher just population in numbers, not even considering like how students are performing, but just sheer numbers. In every school that we've talked to that's similar to us, especially the first graduating class, that first graduating class performed exceptionally well when it came to college admissions. I mean, they saw kids getting into top, top, top tier schools right out the gate that first year. And then it levels out a little bit and becomes a little more similar to, to a normal school. But that first year or two, they saw they saw huge results. So we're hopeful that that will be the case. But like, it's a, it's a leap of faith right now. We can't, we can't provide data because we don't have it. The next year or two will tell us.